Hello and welcome to the research talk on video anonymization. So why are we discussing this topic in this particular lecture? Well, it turns out that there is a big difference in how I see my work, my research work, and how other people see my research work. Now, how I see it is the way how I've explained it to you during the lectures of CB3 DST. That is, challenging topic, it's very hard to track all these number of people. So, I mean, look at the scene here on the right where we have hundreds of people cr just crossing each other, just walking around. It's really hard to put a bounding box around each of them and to track them consistently over time. So for me, it's an incredibly challenging task. And there's actually plenty of applications that need to have bounding boxes or segmentation masks as output that need to understand the images and the world that these images are capturing. For example, autonomous driving, robot navigation, all of these applications actually need to know where, for example, pedestrians are in the scene. And we can provide that capability to autonomous cars or to robots using only cameras. So for me, it is incredibly interesting, but when I explain the work to other people outside of the computer vision community, they see it in a completely different way. They think that multiple object tracking, and in particular, multiple people tracking, is more related to the concept of the big brother. So the concept of following people, identifying them, and trying to find what they do on an everyday basis in order to essentially surveil them. Now, it turns out that for me, for my work, for multiple object tracking, for all the algorithms that we have presented during the lecture, we really do not care if this image is depicting Mark or is depicting John. We only care that we can label these particular pixels of an image with the labeled person or with the label head in this case. So it turns out that the actual identity is not something that we really use for multiple object tracking or segmentation. So this motivates us to look for ways to removing identity from an image so that we can do multiple object tracking and we can release multiple object tracking benchmarks without invading people's privacy. Now, there are many methods that have been used in the past in order to remove, for example, faces. You can blur a face, you can put a square on top of a face, uh, you can perform mosaicing or any type of transformation that will effectively remove the identifying characteristics from that part of the image. But it turns out that this is not entirely useful for autonomous cars or for uh, robots, because when we put a box on top of a face, we can no longer detect it as a face. We can no longer track the face in the video. And the same happens for persons, for full bodies. So if we do any of the techniques mentioned in the previous slide, blurring, mosaicing, or simply putting a square on top of a face or on top of a body, we lose all the work that we have been doing in computer vision and we cannot longer perform multiple object tracking and segmentation. Therefore, in this work, we try to tackle the problem again from a computer vision perspective. So can computer vision solve the problem of privacy and allow other computer vision methods, detection, segmentation algorithms, to do their job? So in this case, what I want to do is not replace the face of a person that I'm detecting on the street with a square or with a mosaic, but I want to replace it with something that will still allow me to identify those pixels as a person or as a face. Now, the properties of my new image should be that it should remain anonymous. So if in the original image, I can quickly say that this face is the face of Laura, in the anonymized image, I don't want to be able to detect what kind of identity is that face depicted. So it should be no one's identity. 
The second characteristic is that we should have a realistic output and realistic to the eyes of a computer vision algorithm. So the computer vision algorithm should still detect it as a face or as a person. We should also have control on the type of identity that we are generating, and I will explain in some further slides why. And we should further have temporal consistency so that we can perform, for example, tracking or video object segmentation. So let's look at different ways of exchanging faces or exchanging bodies that are present in the literature. Let's look at, for example, face swapping. Face swapping is quite a common uh, methodology nowadays uh, to create, for example, deep fakes. So I can quickly swap my face for the face of Brad Pitt. Now, for sure, I will remain anonymous. No one will detect that I was there on that scene. And for sure, it looks realistic because now I can run a face detection algorithm and I will detect indeed a face. But I have not generated a new identity. What I've essentially done is I've created a deep fake. So even though I'm not going to be present in that scene according to a computer vision algorithm, now the computer vision algorithm will detect that Brad Pitt was indeed on that scene at that time, which is not true. This is indeed a deep fake. So this is why we cannot use face swapping for video anonymization. So let's look at the actual methods that do provide a new identity. And I'm going to start here with a small quiz. So this is an anonymized image. And I can tell you that it's the image of a celebrity. He is an actor. And this face has actually been anonymized by a method. And my question is, can you guess who this actor is? You can pause the video and think about it. I can even show you another variation, another anonymization, where the identity of the actor is still not revealed. But now we have different facial characteristics during the anonymization process. And even yet another one. So the question is, have you been able to identify the actor in this image? Let me show you now another method for anonymization. This is the exact same author, um, actor, sorry, and he has been anonymized by another method. And I will show you three variants of that actor being anonymized. So it would be great to actually have feedback, real uh, life feedback from you to know whether you have identified the actor. But usually what happens when I give this presentation live is that people tend to recognize from the top row that this is indeed an image of Nicolas Cage. And it is much easier to recognize the identity from the top row than from the bottom row. Now from the top row, there, this was produced by a method published in ICCB 2019. And in this method, you have quite a lot of control over the anonymization process. And so you can tune up the anonymization to go from less anonymized to more anonymized. So on the right, you have an image where Nicolas Cage is less anonymized. On the left, you have an image where Nicolas Cage is more anonymized. But maybe you will agree with me that there is not much of an anonymization in the top row. So in the bottom row, the characteristics are much more anonymized and it's indeed much harder for Nicolas Cage to be recognized. So this is just one example of the comparison of our method, which we published at the CVPR 2020 versus previous work in which the visual characteristics are not completely anonymized if you actually look at those images. Now, while the previous methods, the previous uh, published work, were able to provide anonymized, realistic and new identities for the anonymization process, they did not allow to have control over those identities. Therefore, being able to assign multiple different identities 
which are of course new, to the same person that is detected at the beginning of our pipeline. And this is something that, as I will explain, we also have in our method. And finally, the last characteristic is the characteristic of temporal consistency. Why do we want to have temporal consistency? This is just because we're interested in still performing multiple object tracking and segmentation. And therefore, if I'm putting a different identity uh, on each frame of the image, I am losing a lot of information that is commonly used in multiple object tracking. And therefore, I would not be able to perform, for example, re-identification over different frames. And here again, I'm not interested in really identifying the person, as in saying, this is the image of Laura. But I'm interested in identifying the same person throughout the video. Therefore, knowing that if this was person 1 in the first frame, I want to know where person 1 went in the 50th frame, which is the end of my video. And again, this is not the same as identified comparing it to a database. Therefore, I'm going to generate new identities. Therefore, I'm not going to be able to find them on any database, but I'm still going to have temporal consistency over the new identities that I'm generating. And this is the goal of CIA GAN, our paper published on uh, CEPR 2020. And it also actually works for full bodies. So we're able to take an image of a full body, not only a face, and change the characteristics of that body, change the clothing, uh, change the shape of the object. So let's look at how this is actually done. Now, the initial input that we're feeding to our neural network is going to be the original image. So I detect the image of a face and I want to anonymize that face. Of course, there is no guarantee here that we're fully anonymizing the image because if there is a face that is not detected as a face, then I'm not going to be able to anonymize it. So this is important to note. So I take my input for the detected phase. And now what I want to provide the neural network is not directly the full image. If I provide the full image, then there is a strong chance that some of the identity will leak to the generated anonymized version. So what I do is I cover the part of the face. I'm only going to anonymize that part. I don't really anonymize hair, for example. So I'm going to cover the face and I'm going to pass to the CNN the image of the background, which consists of the hair and uh, the rest of the background. And in order to give it an idea of what is the pose of the face, I'm going to pass it very few elements of the shape, which are passed in the form of landmarks. So for example, I have the bridge of the nose, the corner of the mouth, and the final shape of the face, the contour of the face. So this is the input uh, that I'm going to work with. And then I'm going to pass it to an autoencoder type of network. So you see here the encoder that compresses the image to a bottleneck representation, and then the decoder which generates the output, which is the anonymized image. And in the bottleneck, I have an MLP that is going to provide the control over the identity that is generated. So the first thing um, that I want to uh, talk about, about the inputs, is why do we actually break down the input into these two parts? So I've already hinted at the fact that we do not want the appearance of the input to leak to the anonymized version. So in order to make sure that this doesn't happen, we completely block the face. Another question is, what kind of landmarks am I going to use in order to pass along some of the information on the pose of the face of the expression? Now we chose, of course, the uh, frame of the face in order to express the orientation. So what kind of orientation does the face have? 
This is really important for faces, but it's even more important for bodies in order to know what kind of pose they are in. The mouth, we also keep it in order to keep expression. If the person was smiling, we want to keep the expression in the output. And finally, the bridge of the nose is used also to infer the orientation of the face. Now, another cool thing about using partial landmarks is that we get temporal consistency for free because landmarks are consistent in time by nature. Therefore, if we use this as input, we achieve some form of temporal consistency. So these are going to help a lot in order to achieve the temporal consistency that we were talking about earlier. Why do we want then the background image, right? Well, the thing is that we need to generate a, a face that doesn't look overly artificial. And for this, ideally what we would want to do it is we would like to blend the face with the background. If we provide the CNN with the background image, which contains, for example, um, here some part of the skin, the color of the hair, of course, some identity is present in, for example, the hair. But we're going to have a much higher chance of obtaining a face that blends nicely with the background. Now, let's discuss how do we train the CNN in order to produce the anonymized versions of the images. Well, the first loss that we're going to use is the GAN loss. We're going to use generative adversarial networks. Generative adversarial networks are typically used to generate realistically looking images. And this is exactly what we want to evaluate here. So our CNN is going to generate an output and we're going to have a discriminator that is going to judge whether that output looks like a real face or not. Now, of course, this judges how real our image looks, but without further losses, the network will overfit and the network will simply do reconstruction. That is, it will return a very similar image to the one that we had at the input. So with the first loss, with the gun loss, we are sure that we're generating a realistically looking image, but not an anonymized image. For that, we have a second loss, which is the identity loss. Now, what this identity loss does is it compares the output image with our training set of different identities, and it looks at whether this identity can be recovered or not. Therefore, whether the identity of the output is the same as the identity of the input, given all the training set that I have. Let's look in more detail at how the identity discriminator works. So this identity discriminator is going to have what we call an identity guidance. So the input to our CNN, the input to the bottleneck, is going to be a one-hot vector encoding of a random ID of the training set. So our training set consists of several celebrity images. We have several images per celebrity. And therefore, we have a fixed set of IDs that we can use in order to anonymize an image. And so we take one of these identities at random and we pass this control, this identity control, which is this one hot vector encoding through an MLP. And we obtain a representation that can then be concatenated with the bottleneck of our CNN. And this is going to be our new identity information. So now, what is the decoder going to do with this information? It has part of the embedding that comes from the CNN and that has characteristics of the old identity, the identity that we're trying to anonymize. And it also has this representation that comes from the MLP, which contains the new identity information. And now what the decoder is going to do is it's going to use this bottleneck, this encoded information of the initial ID and the new ID, and it's going to mix 
both identities. So it is like mixing the input identity with one of the identities of the training set. And so now the question is, given this setup, we have a limited way, a limited um, number of ways in which we can anonymize an image. And in order to be precise, we can anonymize an image only n number of ways. And n is limited um, or is defined by the number of identities that I have in my training set. So what I can do is I can take my input image and I can anonymize it n ways. And this n depends on the number of images that I have in my training set. Sorry, the number of identities that I have in my training set. If I have a thousand celebrities, I'm going to be able to anonymize my image a thousand different ways by mixing my identity with one identity of a celebrity. But now, of course, what I need to do is I need to generate an output that is not detectable as either the initial identity nor the celebrity identity. So I'm going to have an identity discriminator, which is essentially another neural network, which is pre-trained for re-identification on real images. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to further fine-tune this identity discriminator using a contrastive loss during my gun training. So together with the gun training, training the generator, with the gun discriminator that we have discussed before and with the identity discriminator all together. And the goal of this identity discriminator is going to be to bring the embedding of the new generated identity closer to the training ID embedding. So essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring this image to be closer to this image in the real set that was chosen with the one hot vector encoding, I'm trying to bring those embeddings together. And remember, this identity discriminator was trained for re-ID. So these embeddings are used for re-identification. Therefore, I'm trying to bring those embeddings closer together. So I'm trying to make my image closer to the image of the original celebrity. Not going, of course, as far as generating the actual image of a celebrity. So essentially what I want to do is I want to mix both identities. I want to train my gun to the point where I really cannot identify the output image as neither the celebrity nor the input image. So this is the summary of our architecture. Remember the kind of input that we use and how the face of the input image of the original identity is never seen by the CNN. We use the facial landmarks in order to have an idea of the pose of the face and to have temporal consistency for free. And then we have the GAN discriminator that judges whether an image is real or fake and the identity discriminator which brings this image embedding closer to the embedding of the original celebrity identity. Now the identity discriminator, even though it is trained together inside the generative adversarial network framework, it's not really an adversarial, it's not really used as an adversarial to the generator, right? So the classic GAN architecture wants that the generator and the discriminator fight. The generator tries to generate more realistic images, while the discriminator tries to become better at spotting the images generated by the generator, which are fake, and the real images coming from the real world. So that both are fighting in order to, come, to become better and better. In this case, the identity discriminator is used more like a guidance for the generator, not an adversarial. So now the question is, okay, so this works on an image. We know how to anonymize one single image, but what about multiple object tracking, right? So, so we have discussed that we wanted this temporal consistency 
And how are we really going to apply this if we want to, for example, anonymize a multiple object tracking benchmark? Well, at each frame of a video, we can apply the exact same transformation to all pedestrians. By transformation, I mean selecting exactly the same one hot vector encoding for all the frames in the image. So all the pedestrians that can be found on that particular video, let's say 50 frames of the video, they are all anonymized with the same one hot vector. Right? The same transformation is applied to all pedestrians. Now, why do we want to have this? Well, first of all, this will allow us to perform tracking across frames, to re-identify the person across frames and know where that person went from frame 1 to frame 50. And second of all, we're going to have this for all pedestrians which, without actually having to first identify the pedestrians. Right? If I would say I want each pedestrian in the scene to have a different transformation, then I would have to first identify that pedestrian, track that pedestrian, and then I apply the transformation. And this is not really possible, right? We want to do it before we actually perform tracking. And this is why for each frame of my video, I'm going to apply the same transformation to all pedestrians. Now, what happens for a different camera, right? Let's assume that I have one camera on one extreme of the city, one camera on the other extreme. And now I say, well, if I apply the same transformation to all the cameras in the city, I can actually track those persons across cameras. And I can extract long-term tracking information. And with long-term tracking information, there is the danger that I can recover patterns. And with patterns, I might be able to identify a person. So this is something that I want to avoid. So I want to have the control to actually say, well, now I'm in a different camera, I apply a different transformation, I select a different one hot vector encoding, and I will change, I will anonymize the persons in those uh, video frames in a different way. So this is how we can guarantee that the misuse in the data, the potential misuse that you can have by doing long-term tracking is heavily minimized. And this is also nice because it allows you this, um, this level of control where you can say, if I have a set of cameras inside, for example, uh, a building, a, a mall, and I want to have consistent transformation within those cameras because I want to know the patterns of people when they go shopping, you can allow this by having the same transformation for all those CCTV cameras. But then as, as soon as the person steps out of the building of the mall, then the transformation changes and those cameras will anonymize the person in a different way. So let's look at some results. Like, did we actually anonymize images correctly? We're going to look first at qualitative results. And we can see here the source image. So this is all celebrity data set. And we're going to transform these images on the left with different transformations. You can see here the different transformations in the different columns. And each of the transformation is going to be controlled by a different identity here at the top. And you can see roughly how what our methods are doing is it ends up mixing the source with the control identity. So some of the characteristics of the source are passed on to the image, some of, of the characteristics of the control identity are passed to the image. And the result is finally a face that we see that it is indeed a face, but we cannot really identify neither the control identity nor the source identity in those images. Now let's look at some of the quantitative results. So we're going to perform to judge detection and identification on the Celeb A dataset, which is the celebrity dataset that we use for our experiments. So what we're interested in having is we're interested in having models that can detect a face, but models that can not identify a face, right? So our generated face 
has to be detectable as a face, but it cannot be identified as the actual person that was initially in those frames, right? So we want to have high detection, but low identification rates. So if we look at the original image, of course, all of the images can be detected as a face. So our face detector works just fine. And most of the images can also be identified by two identification methods, PNCA and FaceNet. So the identification rate is actually quite high. Now let's see some of the common ways of anonymizing images, which are, for example, pixelization and blurring. Pixelization, we can see the two results here. And of course, I would agree that the identity is really gone, so it's really hard to identify those images with the correct identity. identity identification rate is really low. But also, all the characteristics that make that a face are also gone. So if we apply this type of pixelization on a data set, we can no longer detect faces, we can no longer do tracking. Now let's look at blurring. Blurring has um, another problem. If you blur your image a lot, then you can also not detect it. Some of the detectors don't really work. If you blur the image not so much, then it turns out that the detection is really high, but also the identification is quite high. So I can detect it as a face, but really the identifying characteristics have not vanished and I can still detect that person. So ideally what we want is what our method delivers, which is a high detection rate and a low identification rate. Now let's look at some ablation studies. So what happens if we change some of the architecture choices that we make in our paper? So we can see here our architecture, which we call Siamese, because we have the identity discriminator, which is essentially a Siamese neural network that judges the generated identity with the mapped identity of the celebrity. And so we're going to judge three things. First of all, detection rate, which we saw also in the last experiments, the identification rate, and finally, the visual quality. So there is this measure FID for visual quality that tells you how visually pleasing is this image, how realistic does it look. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to swap our identity discriminator by simply a classification loss. So I'm going to try to identify the identity of the generated image, but without the Siamese training. So simply with the um, softmax cross entropy loss. Now, if I do this and I don't use the Siamese training, my identity recall is going to go down mostly because we observed the generated images were starting to have artifacts all over the place. So you see here how the visual quality is much, much poorer. So in FID, the lower, the better. And we see here that the FID score is much, much worse. So with the classification loss, we're generating images that look less like a face, can be, of course, less identified and have a really poor quality. So it is good that the identification goes down, but not at the expense of generating things which don't look like a face anymore. Another thing that we're trying is what happens if in the input we're using full faces instead of the landmarks that we're proposing. Now, the first thing that we're going to observe is that the detection rate goes a little bit down. But most importantly, the visual quality is poorer. So they are less detectable as a face and we're generating images with poorer visual quality. Now, the last experiment that I want to show you, the last quantitative experiment, is a comparison with state of the art. And we're going to compare with the method that we have presented before that was anonymizing Nicolas Cage, the method presented at ICCB 2019. And this is the middle row here. And how we're going to judge the methods is by their capabilities of de-identifying an image, that is, anonymizing an image. 
So here we're going to compare to two methods for phase identification, VGG phase 2 and Casia. And of course, the lower the identification rate is, the better. And we see how it is very easy to identify the original images, almost 100% identification, but the identification goes down with uh, the Gaffney et al. paper and even further down with our method. So we are able to mask identities be better while providing more diversity in the output by having this control over the identity and also more control for, for example, temporal consistency. And again, this is the, um, the anonymized images for the source image, which is that of Nicholas Gage. And arguably, I would say that we have better anonymization for that particular image. Now, these are other um, anonymizations that we have when uh, we have all kinds of occlusions on the image, like, for example, um, glasses or hair coming uh, into the face or heavy makeup. So we can see here that we can, for example, remove glasses and generate anonymous output without glasses, or even remove facial hair. And we can see here also some funny anonymizations when we anonymize uh, the face of a woman with um, the face of, uh, of a male identity, or uh, vice versa, or when we add, for example, a lot of makeup in the output, because most of the images of celebrities are images with a lot of makeup, so there is this bias in the data set that we are training the anonymization with images that actually contain a lot of makeup. So this tends to generate then uh, these new identities which actually have a lot of makeup. And finally here we can see all types of anonymizations that we have from the source to different uh, anonymizations, more or less makeup, more or less uh, facial hair, so really a large uh, diversity in the anonymizations. And then we have um, uh, other experiments also in the paper that show that this exact same pipeline works really well on a different domain, and that is the domain of body anonymization. So in this case, we can use, instead of the facial landmarks, we can use uh, key points that represent body joints. We can use the, the mask of the person to represent also the pose. We can use any type of input that allows us to keep the pose of the person, but change other characteristics, mostly clothes. And finally, here I want to show some video results. So this is uh, one author of the paper. This is myself anonymized in different ways and also other students in the lab. And you can see that um, there is quite a nice temporal consistency throughout the video. There is some flickering, um, especially on, on the cheeks of the person, but otherwise um, the temporal consistency actually looks pretty nice for the method. But of course, the method is not perfect and it has some limitations. The most important one, in my view, is that we cannot really deal with extreme poses. So the data set that we're using for training has mostly frontal looking faces. So when we have to anonymize a face that is looking a lot to the side, so, so there is this side pose, then we see that in the output we have some unusual artifacts. So we're not really generating a realistic face or we have much more trouble generating a realistic face when we have a side pose. And of course, this is due to several reasons. One of them being that landmark detection works worse with side poses. And the other is that also the method has not been trained with side poses and therefore it cannot generate realistic results. And another limitation that we have is in details like, for example, the gaze. So we cannot really keep the gaze, um, the orientation, the way the eyes are looking to the camera or away from the camera. So, for example, we have here this case where the person is looking downwards, but the generated image is looking 
forward. And this is again a bias in the data set because celebrities tend to look towards the camera when they're taking a picture of them. And therefore, in all the training set, we only have uh, frontal looking eyes. So these are a limitation um, that we have to overcome in future work. So there's tons of things that we can do to make the algorithm better. How to deal with occlusions explicitly, how to work on different domains outside of phase anonymization and body anonymization. Also study the actual effect on multiple object tracking. What happens if I take a data set and I anonymize it? Will tracking methods still behave the same way? Also, it would be really nice to not depend on the output of the landmark. So first of all, if I don't detect a face, I cannot anonymize it. If I don't detect the landmarks correctly, I cannot anonymize it. So we are depending on two previous outputs from two computer vision algorithms in order to do the anonymization. Furthermore, we would like to generate more realistic high definition images. Currently, we're working at a low resolution and generating high resolution images is quite a hard task. And we also want to work on explicit temporal consistency. I would like to thank the team that created this work and also thank you very much for your attention.